I know for decades people have been carrying around this book called The Far Aim. Uh, the Far Aim is not actually an FAA-produced document. You're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lake, and this is episode 11. Thank you for listening. In today's episode, we're going to cover how to use ForeFlight for your check rack. So I just finished a three-part series on the instrument ACS, and uh, if you're preparing to take your instrument um, check ride, I would suggest going back and listening to episode 8, 9, and 10. That covers the instrument ACS. Episode 11 here, I'm doing what what I'm calling just kind of amplifying remarks on the instrument ACS, but this is also useful if you're taking your private pilot, your instrument, your commercial, or even your ATP check ride. Uh, I'm going to go through, again, from a flight ex- examiner standpoint of how I think you should prepare your electronic flight bag, or EFB, for the check ride. So what is an EFB? Right here, four flight. Four flight's your EFB. I'd say 99% of my applicants come through and they're using four flight. So I'm going to go through um, how I think you would be best served to use four flight for your check ride. Uh, because I see a lot of applicants come through and they're just not, they're either not using four flight to its full extent or they really just don't know how to use it well at all. Uh, and and uh, anyway, I just think we could do better. So I'm going to help you be better at using four flight. And then this will help you from your day to day flying as well. It's not just for a check ride. So we're going to get started here. Uh, I'm, I've got my iPad here. That's going to show up on YouTube. So if you're listening on the podcast, it might be better on this one to actually go to YouTube and watch the video because you'll actually get to see uh, my screen. But if you're doing it on a podcast, you can do that as, as well. Just make sure you're at a place where you can pull out your, your uh, foreflight. And as you listen along, I'll describe what I'm doing and you can just follow along on your own iPad. So I've got my iPad here, and I've got it on the home screen, which I can I consider Four Flights kind of heart the home screen, which is the Maps page. So this is where most of the the time you spend on Four Flight is on this Maps page, and you're either you can do mission planning from here. Uh, it's your moving map. You can pull up geo reference charts, uh, airways, uh, sectionals. You know you have all the overlay stuff, and this isn't a video necessarily on the basics of Four Flight, but again how to best use it for your check ride. Um, so this is what the, the screen that most people that have used for flight, they're very comfortable using maps. They, they kind of know how to, to draw a line and the rubber band feature and all that. Um, but it's the other features that are really useful during a check ride. So I think you could walk into a check ride with just for flight. You don't need to bring a tabbed far aim. You don't need to bring any other binders full of information, you can have four flight have everything. And so that's what we're going to talk about right now is some other tabs here. So we're the first tab we're going to go to is your documents tab. Uh, now the documents tab, a lot of people don't know this, but four flight has uh, a cloud based kind of curated, uh, they call them drives and they're at the, in your catalog section of your documents. Mine looks a little different because I have a bunch of custom folders that I've built and I'll show you how to do that. But everybody that has a ForeFlight account has uh, some drives over in the document section. And everybody has the FAA folder and the ForeFlight folder. I know I've got some drives that are, that are shown on there that not everybody's going to have, depending on your subscription level. But everybody's going to have FAA. So that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a custom folder for our instrument check ride. So we're going to click on FAA. And that pulls up on the right-hand side. I'll show you it. The default setting is to show the thumbnails of each uh, document. I don't really like that view. So at the top of the page, there's a little, I call it a hamburger button. It's next to the gear and it shows a, just a text format does not show the thumbnail. That's the way I prefer to look at my documents is I just want to see the, the text name of that document. So in the FAA folder, the first uh, document on there is the digital terminal procedures supplement. This is also a very important document to have uh, the ability to reference during your instrument check ride. So we're going to tap on that document and we're going to then tap on the folder with the plus sign and we're going to create a binder. So we're going to hit the plus sign on the binder and we're going to call it our uh, instrument check ride. 
So we've named a binder and we've added, now we'll click on that, there's a blue check mark, meaning that that uh, digital terminal procedure supplement is in the folder of the binder we, we just called our instrument check ride. So now we have a new binder. Uh, it might be helpful to go through this document and then bookmark some information that's on here. Uh, some stuff that you might find helpful for uh, the check ride, something we talked about is your inoperative components. So if you have inoperative lights at a runway, it might change the minimums, either the ceiling or, or visibility requirements. That's right here on your inoperative component table. So let's go ahead and add a bookmark for that. And we just hit the bookmark. And, and we'll add that as a, as a bookmark. We might also need our, our cold air, uh, cold weather air temperature correction. And then we might add our, our circling criteria, our updated uh, or expanded circling criteria. And then at the very back, we've got our uh, climb and descent table that I like having reference to. So we just created, um, I think, four bookmarks. So if we hit the search button now and we select bookmarks, We've got all the bookmarks that we just kind of tabbed out on our uh, electronic, our digital terminal procedure supplement. So that's the first thing that we're going to add. Next thing, we're going to go back to our FAA folder, and we're going to add the international flight plan form. We're going to add that to our instrument check ride binder. Because remember, one of the skills that we have to display is filing a simulated flight plan, and uh, due to the current regulations, when you're filing IFR, even in the United States, you have to file an international flight plan. So having that international flight plan form, that's important. I'm going to show you actually a better way to get this flight plan form, but it's good to have the uh, the FAA default one in that binder so you can discuss that with the DP if that comes up in the check ride. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're open up the uh, federal aviation regulations. So I know for decades people have been carrying around this book called the FAR AIM. Uh, the FAR AIM is not actually an FAA-produced document. Now, the FARs are produced by the government, right? Those are federal aviation regulations. And the AIM is the Aeronautical Information Manual. It's produced by the FAA every year. Uh, and an organization, a private organization called ASA, actually was the first to create a book where they combined the two. They combined some select FARs and the AIM, and they put it into one Full, or one uh, book that they publish every year that pilots can kind of easily carry around because you couldn't carry around all of the FARs. There's thousands of FARs, uh, but there's about 20 or 30, I think, in the FAR AIM and uh, the Aeronautical Information Manual. So it's just those FARs that you use most often. Well, ForeFlight kind of did the same thing here. They curated a list of the FARs that are the most common used ones by pilots, and they put them in their cloud drive here so you can download them and have them on your ForeFlight. So we're going to select for our instrument check ride, we're going to add uh, FAR 61. We'll add that to a binder, our instrument check ride binder, and then we'll add FAR 91. We'll add that to our binder. Uh, we're going to go back into these documents and bookmark some important spots in there. Uh, those are the two that we're going to add there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add part 135, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I think there's some useful things that you could use in part 135, even though we're not taking a 135 check ride, we're taking it under uh, part 61 and 91, uh, but I, th I think there's some additive stuff in part 135, and we'll, we'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, the next thing we're going to go to is the handbooks section. So in the handbook section, I've got my instrument airman certification standards. So I'm going to add that to my check ride binder. I've got my uh, aeronautical information manual, the AIM, of course. need to add that to my binder. Um, and then we're going to do the instrument flying handbook. We'll add that to our instrument check ride binder. And then our instrument procedures handbook. We're going to add that to our binder. We've got nine documents in there. And then Probably the last one I'm going to do is the ICAO filing quick reference, which is actually in the ForeFlight binder. I'm going to add that. This is a, the the ICAO filing quick reference guide is the best tool I've found for learning how to file an ICAO uh, style flight plan. ForeFlight does a great job of talking you through how to set up your aircraft's equipment and to file that because there's a it, there's kind of an acronym soup that you need to know as far as your equipment codes 
so your modes and codes for your aircraft to get that filed correctly. And that this guide really helps you do that, and it's produced by ForeFlight. That's the best one i found. There's one produced by the FAA that I don't really like. It's, it's not very well formatted. So now we go up to our instrument checkride binder now. We've got nine documents in here. Uh, we've already bookmarked our digital terminal procedures supplement, so we don't need to do that. Uh, for FAR 61, I'm going to open that one, and when you hit the search function, you have three options. You can search for words, you can search the contents, because it is a hyperlinked document, so it already has kind of an index that you can navigate through quickly, and then I can search bookmarks. So I'm going to go to contents first, and I'm going to select uh, subpart B, and in subpart B, that's where we're going to find our uh, instrument rating requirements of 6165. And I'm going to bookmark that. I'm going to bookmark 6165 because that's that'll be a good one to kind of know, especially going into your instrument check ride, that you're taking the check ride in 6165. That is, is what defines that uh, for what you need to do. The, the next thing that we're going to do is we'll go to... Let's see, use of flight center. I think 6165, we'll stick with that. That'll be good. We're going to go back to our binder, and we're going to select FAR 91. And look at that. I already have instrument flight rules there, so I'm going to bookmark that. So that is 91167, instrument flight rules. And that covers my uh, fuel requirements, my IFR flight plan requirements. So I'm going to go ahead and put a bookmark on this one. Uh, now I'm going to go to uh, 135, FAR 135, which you, you're thinking, well, well, Seth, I'm taking this check right under 61 and 91. I don't need to know 135, but uh, and, and here's my argument for it. Most of us that are taking this check right, I'd say a slight majority of people taking the instrument check right are probably going into aviation as a career. And if you go into aviation as a career, there's a good chance you're going to spend some time uh, with a 135 holder. Even the major airlines have 135 certificates, so you're going to need to know this eventually if you're going to be a professional aviator, more than likely. And the reason I like 135 minimums for instrument flying is we're going to hit the search contents, uh, and we're going to go uh, our VFR, IFR operating limitations, and we're going to go IFR alternate minimums at an airport. And we're going to bookmark this. The reason I like to bookmark this is when you're developing personal minimums, FAR 135 minimums are actually higher than the minimums required for Part 91. So you've probably heard that FA in, under Part 91 we could take off 00. Well, you can't do that in 135. So when a DPE asks you uh, about, you know, what, what are your personal minimums, you could say, well, I'm, I've developed my personal minimums by looking at what 135 does, and I've kind of built them from that. And that just kind of shows you, uh, or shows me, the examiner, that you're taking it seriously. You're not just arbitrarily picking numbers. You're picking something uh, out of 135, and you can point to it. And the limitations, I think, are, are reasonable, and uh, it, it provides a good buffer over what Part 91 requires, which really isn't that much. So that's the reason. This is just a technique. You definitely don't have to do that. You'll probably hear people uh, tell you, well, you don't want to bring up 135 in a check ride because you're just opening yourself up for more questions. I don't think uh, an examiner would do that. I think as an examiner, I'd be impressed like, okay, well, you've gone really above and beyond. You've kind of looked into 135. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Those are uh, higher minimums than what's required of you in 91, and they're probably safer because of that. So that's something I would do. We've got our instrument rating airman certification standards. That's uh, already included in ForeFlight. So if you have a ForeFlight subscription, you have a digital copy of the instrument ACS. You just have to look in the document section. So that's in there. We've got our AIM. I'm not going to bookmark anything specific in that. I will open it up and show you that your contents uh, are, are uh, hyperlinked, and they're pretty easy to navigate. I can just tap through here and look at the different sections as required. So, so that's a good thing to have on there. I've got my instrument flying handbook, my instrument procedures handbook, and my ICAO filing quick reference guide. So all these documents, I think 99% of the questions that you're going to get asked in your instrument check ride, the answers are going to be in one of these documents. 
Uh, oh, and before I forget, one more that would have to do with weather, and this document would be good for the private pilot as well, uh, but go back to your FAA handbooks, and you're going to select, there's actually a couple of advisory circulars in the handbook section. One of the advisory circulars is the 006 Bravo, which is aviation weather. One of my favorite advisory circulars. I did a podcast uh, and video about aviation weather before, uh, I believe, in the private pilot series. But this 006 Bravo, great advisory circular to read through. And you can see, again, it's hyperlinked. It has 23 chapters. So it's a rather large advisory circular, more like a book. That's what's in the manual section, I think. Um, but if if you read through some of these sections, particularly uh, what I think is is uh, useful are air masses and fronts and the wave cyclone model. That's chapter 10 of the 006 Bravo. Uh, that's a really good chapter because I think that if you have a fundamental understanding of the air masses and frontal movements, then you're a, a long ways towards understanding weather at a fundamental level. Uh, and so that's a really useful thing to use. So I do have a podcast and video on weather, so you can look that up for more information about this advisory circular. But this would be useful to add to my instrument check ride document so, uh, or binder. So now I've got 11 documents in this binder. And again, I think that's the 99% of what you need to know for the check ride is in this binder now. And I don't have a big crate of, uh, of three ring binders or, or a big far aim. It's just all neatly on here on my iPad. So... That's step one. Uh, step two, you know, a couple days before your check ride, your examiner is going to give you some sort of scenario. So I would start to build that cross country scenario on my map page here, and just I'll show you real quick my process for doing this. And I think it would it's probably um, the best process that I know of to to show that you're prepared for the check ride. So let's say I'm going to go from Russellville. And I'm going to fly IFR uh, to Addison, Texas. Uh, so I'm going to put those two points, uh, KRUE and KADS, in my maps page. Now, if I take three fingers and I touch the screen at the same time with three fingers, it, it centers the route, the entire route, on the screen. So that's a quick way to just see kind of the 40,000-foot view, if you will, of my route from point A to point B. So I've made the first step. Now I know this is an instrument check ride, so I really don't want to plan a flight direct, an RNAV direct route, not on airways. So I want to look for a route here. Uh, well, before I do that, I need to assign an aircraft. So I'm going to select from my tail numbers. Uh, I have a modes and codes uh, video that goes through how to build the proper modes and codes uh, with the ICAO uh, the model for your aircraft. So you can look that up. Uh, if I can remember, I'll put it in the comments below here. Uh, so I'm going to select that. I'm going to select a performance profile, and I'm going to select an altitude, whichever altitude I think is appropriate based on the winds. 6,000 feet looks great today for the travel air, and that's what I'll use to plan. And then I'm going to pick routes. Now, the route advisor in ForeFlight, uh, there's, there's some things that are a little confusing about this. Some people think that this is the recommend, like a official FAA recommended route, and it's not. It's what's for flight servers kind of. It might have a, a basic AI. Really, it's probably just an algorithm that says, "Hey, based on your your uh, point A to point B route and what people have filed in the past, this is what for flight recommends." It's not what the FAA recommends. So, in our case. Uh, from Russellville to Addison, we have a recommended route of uh, PRX and the Finger 7 arrival. And then if we look down, we've got another section that says ATC cleared. So we see that there's been several instances of a cleared direct. Uh, there's been a few instances of uh, different, just like the point SASE. Uh, but down here, we've seen one that is 14 times it's BYP finger seven. So that's been the most common is the BYP finger seven. So I'm going to go with that one. I'm going to take a look at that and select that route. And it looks pretty direct. Uh, I don't have an airway between Russellville and BYP. That's a pretty long uh, route where I don't have an airway. So depending on what your examiner asks, uh, you may want to insert a 
a Victor Airway route in there, or they might accept some sort of uh, RNAV route. We're just going to go ahead and say, hey, we, we need to incorporate some sort of Victor Airway in our flight plan. So we're going to use the rubber band effect, and we're going to rubber band here down to this point called Meow. And we're going to add uh, we're going to add meow to our point, and then we can see that that's uh, well that's a jet route. Sorry, that's that's not going to work. We want uh, so you get to see some settings here. Our airways we want to select our low airways. So now that has changed things up a little bit. So. So we entered in Victor 124. Uh, meow wasn't going to work. Uh, I forgot to delete that out of there because that was on the jet route. So the low route, we're going to start at HOT. So Victor 124, HOT, and we're going to follow HOT down to PRX, then PRX to BYP, and then the finger 7 arrival. So my route now uh, looks a little more uh, circuitous, we'll call it, but it meets the intent of the ACS. It incorporates a Victor Airway, incorporates RNAV. I've got an arrival in there. Uh, so I'm really happy with this, with this route. The next thing I'm going to do is a select a departure time. So we're going to do this ideally the day prior, right? We don't want to do it day of, uh, but we're going to update it day of. But the day prior, so uh, we'll go, we can... We can select the now option and then just move it over to, to Thursday, which today's the second, so tomorrow's the third. So I've moved it over to tomorrow, and I've got everything set on my map. And the way I, I can see that I've got everything set is I don't have any exclamation points down here except in the little briefcase item, which just means I haven't packed yet. So I can go ahead and tap the briefcase and hit pack. And that packs up my NOTAMs, uh, fuel prices, weather, SIGMETs, all that. I'll, now, I've seen some confusion where folks think that tapping the brief, briefcase and packing is the same as briefing the, the uh, flight. And that's not the case. To brief the flight, we need to take one more step. And that's tap the uh, share icon, which is just next to the briefcase, two icons over. We're going to hit the share icon, and we're going to send two flights. So we're going to send that flight plan to our flights. So here we are, it automatically switched over to our flights display, and now we've got uh, our flights on here, and we have some options up at the top, nav log briefing, we have don't, don't have any files associated with that, and we don't have any messages. Uh, our departure and destination is in there, Russellville and ADS. Our alternate is blank, so we need to talk about that here in a second. Uh, and if we scroll down, we see various uh, options depending on the level of subscription that you have at ForeFlight. Now, even the base model of subscription has the ability to brief, and that's at the very top is our briefing. So that's one of the first things we're going to want to do is brief this flight. So we're going to tap on briefing, and what this is going to do is build a standardized weather briefing that includes NOTAMs, uh, closed runways, all of that, uh, and that also ties it to a tail number, it ties it to your user profile, and it saves it in the ForeFlight um, database for 20 days. So the fact that you completed this briefing gets saved for 20 days. That's important because if there's any instance where we need to look back and see, did you do your due diligence as a pilot and brief uh, the flight, it's captured in this database, and we can verify that, yeah, Seth briefed this on the 2nd of February, and he went through all the pages. So up of our briefing, on the top left, we have, I call it a hamburger button, those three lines. We can tap on that, and that expands our menu item for um, all of the uh, types of information that are in the briefing. You can see some items are grayed out. That means they don't apply. So just looking at it right now, we know we have a TFR. We don't have any closed or unsafe NOTAMs. We don't have any SIGMETs, AIRMETs, or urgent PIRAPs because they're all grayed out. Uh, the next thing that's up is the synopsis. So this pulls up our uh, prog chart or surface analysis chart. Uh, this is one of the charts I'm going to ask 100% of my instrument students to analyze the current surface analysis chart. I want to see that you know what a cold front is, what a warm front is, what weather is associated with a cold front versus a warm front. I want to make sure you know how to do that. So we're going to talk about our surface analysis. Uh, we're going to look at METARs, PIREPs, and TAFs. Now, TAFs are really important because this is what's going to drive me to maybe go back to my flights and file an alternate. So I'm going to look here 
and see that my nearest uh, my nearest airport, Dallas Love, is their TAF is is looks like no matter what time during the day, it's going to drive an alternate. So I'm going to hit the back button right now, and I'm going to select an alternate. So I'm going to let the alternate um, advisor kind of do its job here in ForeFlight, and it's going to go out and it's going to search for potential alternate legal alternates for me to use. So it looks like the best one would be Fort Worth Alliance. Uh, so Fort Worth Alliance, four statute miles broken, 1,500 snow. It's got a long runway. It's got an ILS localizer. I'm going to go ahead and pick that one, and I'm going to use that as my alternate. Now, I want to go down. I'm going to have to plan for my fuel for this, right? And I can do that if you have the premium version of ForeFlight. You can actually set a fuel policy that includes your alternate fuel and your reserve fuel. So this will actually help you. If you have it configured correctly, it will help you plan for that alternate. But once I have my alternate selection selected, I'm going to go back and do another briefing. The reason is, the first time I did this briefing, it only had two airports. I want to do the briefing that includes my alternate because I want to know the weather at my alternate as well as any potential NOTAMs uh, at that alternate airport. So now if I hit that hamburger button, my NOTAMs section has my departure destination and my first alternate. I can add up to two alternates, but in this case I just have my, my first one. Uh, my current weather, if I go to METARS, it includes my first alternate, which is marginal VFR. And if I go to my TAF section, I should have a, there you go, I have a TAF of my alternate now. So by adding my alternate and then going back and briefing, it makes sure that my briefing encapsulates the information that I need for my alternate. So that's enough about the briefing. It's pretty self-explanatory. Get comfortable using it. Do a few briefings and see how ForeFlight lays everything out. I like the briefing structure there because it tells you adverse conditions first, which I think that law of primacy is important. Just human thing is the first thing you hear is typically the first thing you or the thing you remember most. So ForeFlight takes advantage of that and they make sure they tell you about adverse conditions first and not kind of pages and pages of notums that may or may not be helpful. They tell you adverse conditions first and then they get into the rest of the stuff. So get comfortable using that briefing function and pull that out during your, your check ride and say, all right, uh, for me analyzing the weather for my route, I'm using the briefing structure from ForeFlight. Now, if you want to just kind of do an a la carte uh, type of weather briefing, so a self-briefing, or maybe there's some icing that you really want to dig into, you do that through ForeFlight using the imagery tab. So by clicking on the imagery, I can pull up tons of weather data. And this is all coming from aviationweather.gov. So it's the same as going to aviationweather.gov, uh, except you're just using it on ForeFlight. So uh, right now, I happen to be doing this podcast when we have a winter weather advisory coming coming in. So I'm going to look at my six-hour icing forecast. And uh, I'm typically, you know, we're, we're filing for 6,000 feet. So I might look at the 9,000-foot icing severity forecast, and I can already see some areas of trace to light icing in this area of Arkansas. So that right there might drive me to uh, say, hey, I'm, I'm potentially no-go because at 9,000 I have icing. 7,000 seems to be clear. That's within 1,000 feet of our, um, of our cruising altitude. And 5,000 feet is looking really bad in northwest Arkansas already. Uh, so that would definitely be a no-go. Those red items are SLD. That's a super-cooled liquid droplet. That's like severe, clear icing, you know, crash your airplane type of icing I want to avoid. Um, so we we can dive into that specific type of icing analysis if we see something in the briefing that we want to kind of expand upon. So that's uh, a section of ForeFlight that I would use for that. So, so far... I've showed you how to set up your documents page. I've showed you how to use the flights function to brief your flight. Uh, I've showed you the imagery page where we can find a bunch of weather data that's really important to us. Uh, and then on our maps page, how we're using this to interact and, and kind of plan our flight. Now, the last thing that I'll show is during your check ride, uh, more than likely, if I have you, 
for instance, if I have you plan a, uh, a flight from Russellville to Addison for your instrument check ride, we're not actually going to fly from Russellville to Addison. What we're going to do is start out on your cross country, and we might wind up flying from Russellville to Hot Springs, and then we're going to stop the cross country portion at Hot Springs and do approaches there and back here at Russellville. And we'll know about that prior to the check ride. So I want to set up and start looking at my instrument approach plates that I might fly at, at both here at Russellville and down at Hot Springs. Those are kind of my two airports I want to focus in on. So for that, I'm going to go to my plate function. So on my plates, I've got, again, I've got the option to um, do some binders here where I can add binders. So I can add flight binders. Uh, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to select my departure as Russellville and my second airport as Hot Springs. So I'm just going to type in K-H-O-T. There we go. And so now I have uh, Russellville and, uh, and Hot Springs in there. I've got the ability to pull up different approaches here, my departure procedures, my takeoff minimums, which ForeFlight just added this function. And thank you, ForeFlight, if you're watching it's amazing because now when I click on my takeoff, my alternate takeoff minimums, it takes me directly to the page with Russellville or directly to the uh, the page with, with whatever airport, and I don't have to scroll through the entire kind of region's takeoff obstacles until I get to Russellville. So thank you for doing that. Um, what I might do here in preparation for my check ride is I'm going to hit the annotate button, and I'm going to just draw a nice big circle around Russellville, and then for uh, Hot Springs, I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, actually, for that, I'll hit Done. I'll go to Binders, and I'll just add um, my departure procedure for or my takeoff minimums for Hot Springs. Since I have it loaded as my arrival, it wants to show me my alternate minimums. So if I wanted to get Hot Springs departure, what I could do is change my departure to Hot Springs, pull up its uh, departure takeoff minimums, and then I can draw a nice circle around that one. So I've got both takeoff minimums, non-standard takeoff minimums for Hot Springs and Russellville. So what am I going to look at here? Uh, the thing that I'm going to look at are my actual takeoff minimums or my ODPs. And that's kind of a subset, so I might pick a different color here, uh, a different little highlighter, and I'm going to look at uh, my takeoff minimums and my departure procedures. Uh, so my non-standard takeoff minimums or my ODPs, uh, and I'm going to analyze those for both or any airport that I think I might have to use on my check ride because the examiner very well could ask me about this. If you're flying with me, I'm definitely going to ask about non-standard takeoff minimums, what they mean, how to identify if they exist, and uh, what ODPs are, how to know what the ODPs are. So this is um, this is a really important subject for me. I might do a full podcast on alternate takeoff minimums and TERPS data, uh, but that'll be in the future here. So we're just building our, our binder here right now. So we've got uh, our binder up here with our hot springs to uh, Russellville. And the way we do that there, we've got our flight binders of Hot Springs to Russellville, and we have our, our plates pulled up. So now, using our plates binder, we can easily transition between all the approaches available at Hot Springs and all the approaches available at Russellville. So that's really good. We, we're going to add all of those, and then for Hot Springs, we're going to add the approaches. Well, not the Jeppesen. And then our airport diagram, there we go. So now, if we go to our binders, we have seven plates in our Hot Springs binder. That's all ready to go and ready to reference. Uh, so I've got my, my uh, documents set up, I've got my flights set up, and I've got my plates loaded, and I'm ready to go. The other thing, uh, as far as using ForeFlight on the check ride, um, your examiner could do a couple of things with your actual floor flight. They might turn off geo-referencing. Uh, that's not something that I actually do in the instrument check ride, but what I will 
do or at least talk about is what are you going to do if this thing overheats or run out of batteries? What's your plan? So I would also make sure that I have some form of backup, be it my iPhone or another iPad. But that's a very important thing that you need to address is what is your backup before flight fails you? If your iPad fails you, what are, what are you going to do? And I would recommend either using your iPhone or using a, uh, another digital backup. And just show me as an examiner that you've thought about that potential. Uh, something that really helps in knowing if you're ready to go is, is a checklist. And ForeFlight has a checklist function for that. And it's called the, um, the EFB checklist. And so if you go to the EFB pre-flight checklist, it's a default checklist in ForeFlight. The way you can find that is you go to the checklist feature. You might have to hit your hamburger button and pull up the checklist feature. You hit the plus sign, you scroll all the way to the bottom, and you've got three checklists under the other column. One's the EFB pre-flight, one's the I am safe checklist, and one's a passenger brief. So just select that EFB pre-flight, and it goes through your charging data, flight planning, and final actions uh, for configuring your EFB for a flight. It's a really useful checklist. If you show up to the check ride and you show me you have an iPad, you have a backup iPad or iPhone, and you've completed the EFB checklist that ForeFlight gives you, man, I have a lot of confidence that you're going to be a safe instrument pilot and that you're well prepared for the check ride. And it, it just makes things go so much smoother. Uh, I can't even say how much that would impress me if an applicant showed up with that. So that's something that'd be really good to do. Um, all right. So I think I've gone through the basics of how you configure your iPad for a check ride. Uh, I would love to hear your comments. If anything you have about uh, ForeFlight, how to use ForeFlight on a check ride, how to use ForeFlight in general, uh, my email is in the comment section below or the notes below. Uh, if you're listening on podcast, it'll be on the, the podcast notes. Uh, but it's Seth at bsl.aero. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your feedback. And uh, please think about sharing the show with your friends or your students if you're an instructor. Uh, I really want to get this material out there and help you do better on your check ride. Uh, again, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.